Welcome to the Helix webinar series. Today's session is on what's new in BMC, um, Helix Digital Workplace, so 23.301. Um, the two presenters we've got today is Carl Anders Falk, uh, CAF for short, many of you will know. And we also have Deepak Rudra, um, our product manager based in the US. Um, he's also going to be co-presenting. And then we've been very fortunate to be joined by Des, who's going to be doing some demos today from our solutions engineering team. So welcome, guys. Um, so before we get started with the intros and the agenda, um, just a quick reminder to say um, all of you will be muted while we go through the demos and the presentation. Please don't let that put you off to put up your questions into the Q&A. You'll find that at the bottom section of Zoom. Um, we will endeavour to answer those during the presentation when they're not presenting, and then we will go to live Q&A at the end, roughly the last 15 minutes. Um, so without further ado, if I can hand over, Kath, I believe you're going to get started first. Okay. Hey, everybody. Nice to be back again. We have a new upcoming release packed with new features. So I'm uh, glad to be able to present it for you today together with Deepak and uh, Des. And uh, we'll just move on to the next slide here. I have them on all <laughs> here. So uh, as always, some of this is, I mean, it's it's plans. And the, the interesting thing is we are releasing patch one on Friday this week. So it's just a few days before the release. Uh, but still, we have to say that it, it is a future looking statement. And um, you can't really share this outside this forum. And uh, it, it, we, we might not do everything that we say here. but. As I said, it's just a few days, so we know pretty well what's coming. The focus in digital workplace this uh, period has been on a few uh, uh, value statements. The first one is productivity. We want to ensure that the employees in a company are as productive as possible. So that is number one. The second part is uh, making sure we can provide a personalized experience, meaning when you work in DWP, you will get something that makes sense to you, is personalized to you. And uh, the third part is about removing silos, which is more collaboration between teams, between people, and making sure you can become productive there as well. And at the end, there are some things that uh, help you as an employee to be a little bit faster in, I would say, administering DWP and uh, increase the productivity there as well. So let's move on to uh, the next slide, which is about uh, Helix GPT. And if you remember in 23.300, we launched Helix GPT first phase uh, as a controlled availability, which means we have a few customers working with Helix GPT already. This is here today to show some of that. He has been out there talking to a lot of customers and there is a, a tremendous interest in this, I would say. So he's a busy man, but he has promised to, to join us today and do a little bit of demo on the virtual agent side of the house, I would say. So uh, what he's going to talk about is that we can automatically generate prompts for our Helix GPT. So it can ask you the questions in the catalog items you have. Uh, this is uh, very quick to do, and uh, he will show how you do it, and then show that you can actually raise catalog requests from the virtual agent using Helix GPT as the engine. As you know, we had Watson as the engine before, but now we have put uh, Helix GPT behind it, which makes it a lot faster to, to get to production with the catalog items. Uh, next one uh, is before we had chat with your knowledge base only, and we were talking about Helix knowledge management, ITSM knowledge management, and business workflows knowledge management. So you could ask questions against our knowledge bases we have extended that now and uh, we have SharePoint support. So if you have document libraries with PDF files or Word documents, you can also ask questions about those libraries. 
And for Confluence, we can do the same thing. You can do PDF or uh, documents, uh, Word documents, and actually the SharePoint native documents as well. So that's uh, more knowledge in different places in the company. And we have also added the possibility to ask questions uh, about requests and approvals in DWP. So we we are investing a lot here and moving forward with, with new features all the time. Uh, another thing which we didn't have before but have now is the ability to filter uh, so that when you talk, you can create a studio page, I would say, in DWP that has filters so that it only responds to things about HR, for example, or about IT. And I had a call with a customer yesterday, actually, and they were really uh, hooked up on this when I was talking about that. We want to have a separate page for IT. We want to have a separate page for HR. And when you ask questions, it should be as narrow as possible. So those filters are important. Uh, so that is Helix GPT. I will do a quick demo afterwards, and then Des will do another demo before we hand over to, to Deepak. I will also show you another important thing, the personalized homepage. As you know, in Studio, you could select a page as homepage. That homepage was global. And uh, that was uh, a thing a lot of customers wanted to change. So if you log in and work for the HR department, you get to that HR page every time you log in. And if you work in IT, you get to another page and so on. So different teams could see different things. That could be also uh, geographical locations. If you're in India, you won't have one page. And if you're in Sweden, like I am, you want to see a different page. So the landing page is uh, definitely different if you use this functionality. Uh, it is the navigation builder in Studio that we have um, extended with new, new tabs. One is for the home page assignment. And then you can have rules for which pages show up. And you can put many in there. So there is a, a quite advanced feature to decide which page you see. The other thing that we got a lot of questions about is, oh, this my activity, do we actually have to go back to my activity after submitting a request every time? And now we have fixed that as well. So you see on uh, here, you can see that there is a third tab uh, actually here <laughs> uh, where you can decide where you end up after having submitted the request. You don't really need to end up at my activity anymore. You can come back to the, the main page, for example. So that is also configurable. So I'll show that as, as well in the demo. I think it's time for demo now. Now let's see if I can switch uh, the share screen because I have it on another screen. Um, it's... Uh, which one? This one, hopefully. Yeah. Do you now see your? Yeah, it's good. Telecomia service portal, right? Yeah. You see my good. screen? Yeah. Okay. Good. So, uh, like I said before, the this um, this is is just the studio page, and here uh, we have. Um, a chat bar from that is powered by Helix GPT, and uh, what what we have done now is to support other sources than the knowledge basis. So I have asked before already, what is the capital of Canada? And there is no knowledge article about that. But as you see, Helix GPT is going out and it's finding out it's it's uh, Ottawa in Canada, and I can ask other questions like, uh, what is the largest city in Canada? Uh, like that. And you see, I, I misspelled it there. I left it misspelled by purpose just to show you that 
the large language model does actually handle misspellings as well. Uh, you see down here, it's it's talking about the PDF, and uh, this PDF is actually stored on a SharePoint. So if I click on this one, I can cite, and uh, you see it's it's a PDF that is a, a copy of a Wikipedia page, and uh, it took the largest city from here, and it took the capital here from Ottawa. Uh, there is there is a lot you can ask about here, so. We can we can ask about essentially anything. Uh, let's let's try one. Uh, where can I watch visual art in Canada? Could that be something? So you see, it's it's giving you an answer based on what's in there. So so this is one of the things you can do: talk to SharePoint and Confluence. I don't have a Confluence, I can't show you that, but uh, it's there. Uh, the other thing is you can say, "Do I have uh, requests open?" So this is talking to DWP now. So it's not only chat with your knowledge base, but actually chat with you with the DWP. And you can see it's uh, it's having a number of, of open requests here, and I can click on it, and it opens up uh, the actual request in DWP. Uh, I also have other ones here, like this one. It's uh, waiting for approval, so I can ask a question like, um, uh, do I have pending requests? And uh, when I do that, I get uh, information about that specific one. You see, it's, it's limiting them to, to the specific one, uh, which is there. And this one is waiting for approval from uh, a friend of mine, which is called, uh, what's the name of that? <laughs> Porky Pig. It's a good name, isn't it? <laughs> so uh, if I ask here, do I have any pending approvals? I can do that again. It's, it's already there. Do I have any approvals? So it's it's going out and it's doing the same thing there. Orky Pig is my friend. Okay, I think uh, that is giving a feeling for what we have done with the Helix GPT. Uh, I'm not going to go into more details about this. I will show you the other thing as well that we were talking about. Um, let's uh, let's log. Let's. Um, actually log in here. If I log in here and I'm logged in as uh, Victor, you see he's ending up on this page looking like this. So this is the home page that is assigned to him. And if I raise a request now, I have a simple two question request here just to, to demo. Where do you end up after submitting the request? And uh, I've set it to, to come back to the same page. And now you come back here. In, in the previous releases, you always came back to this lovely page. Uh, but now you come back to, to the home page. And um, I'll log out from here. And I'll actually log in. Uh, here to the same environment. And now I'm logged in as uh, someone else. And then I end up on, on this page. So this is Alan that we use in many cases. And uh, it's the same here. If you um, 
if you raise the request, I will use the same one and put A and B in here and submit this request. He has been configured so that he ends up on the same page as he starts out from. So uh, I think that was all I was planning to talk about. And uh, I'll hand over to uh, to Des. Are you ready to show us a little bit how you take a catalog item and then you can make chatify it and chat with it through Helix GPT? Uh, yes, let's do that. Let's do that. Let me share my screen. Please do. Can you take over or do I have to stop sharing? Or... I can take over from you. Thank you. Yes, we oh. can see you. All right. So what we've got here from the from the, the digital work workplace portal, the first thing we're going to look into is um, just just the way it stands today. So I'm going to look for uh, I'm looking for a letter of verification. Uh, verification. There we go. Um, now you'll notice that uh, my my my, my uh, DWPs come back with search versus GPT. So you know I've got it to set to search only. Um, but you know if I want to, I could have it come back with a GPT response. Um, so I'm going to go down to my um, my employment verification because that that was what I was looking for, and I can go and execute my request. Now, obviously within this request, you've got your your, your series of questions that, that need to be answered. So, do I need salary information? When do I need it by? Um, and any other relevant information, right? Um, so that's easy enough to submit. Now, this this process is quite easy to now train the virtual agent on. And let me take you through that process. OK, so if we go into uh, Innovation Studio, um, to go into my BMC chatbot, and I can click on Actions, Publish Chat Enable Service. Now, the first thing you'll recognize is if you've done this with Watson in the past, you will be able to do this with, you, you, you'll have the same kind of approach to follow, right? The difference being, we're going to select Helix GPT. OK, second thing we'll select is, uh, this is where we want to set this up for virtual agent. And within virtual agent, we've now got a series of skills for GPT. So these could be different chatbots answering different questions or targeting different services. Um, and I can then um, so select that specific skill that I want. So in, in my case, it's a seal nine skill. Next thing we do, click on next and click find the, the service that I want. So I want to go verification. There we go. And I can select my letter of employment verification. It's going to populate the uh, the, the words that it's, that it's looking for, so it's going to look for a specific uh, clarification phase. So, you know, what's beautiful about the, the large language model and what differs between this and Watson is I may put in the employment verif verification, but the large language model is able to understand that in multiple different ways. So, you know, it, I could I could ask, well, I need a letter of employment or I need a verification letter for my employment or that kind of thing. And I don't have to have those set up as different variations because the large language model handles that. OK, what I'm then going to do is move across to the series of questions. And you'll notice the questions are pre-populated, right? So do you want your salary information? Um, when do you need it by? So date and time. Um, and then the free text field of adding in additional information. So from here, I simply click on the Publish button. That Publish button will create the prompts that are needed for the, 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 the large language models to understand what we're trying to do, OK? now. I already got that created, so I don't need to publish that. But now that that's published, I simply then need to go back to my virtual agent, and I can ask it how to to do, to do that. Okay, so the training or the 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 understanding of of the virtual agent to be able to um, execute on that digital workplace request is very simple, very easy to do. Okay, and it can be customized obviously by virtual agent. So, <laughs> excuse me, if I go back to my digital workplace. <clears throat> and I go back to my home, I'm going to link up my little virtual agent on the right-hand side here. 
So I can tell it, um, I would like a letter verification um, for tomorrow. Okay. Simple, plain, uh, in, in, my, in my language, English. Um, but it's able to understand that it's looking for a letter ver of verification. What it does, it'll go into the virtual agent. That virtual agent will understand that there's a service request that needs to be executed here. And then move it on to the prompt for creating a letter of verification. And you'll notice, there we go, it's asked me, do I need the salary information included for the letter? I'm going to go, no, I don't need that. What it's then going to do is going to send that back and say, okay, so when do you need it by? Uh, next, we'll say, I need, it by, uh, I need next Monday. Uh, it will confirm the date. And yes, no additional information. Perfect. What it's going to do now is it's summarizing all the information that I've just put in. You know, uh, I need my letter of, of, of uh, verification, no salary information, need it for next Monday, Monday the 11th. I hope that's the right date. Um, and then what I'd like to confirm is the, uh, to submit. Yes, please. <laughs> what this will do, this will now take all this information, link it back up to the fields that we saw earlier, um, and actually execute on that, on that service request. So uh, it, it should come back to me now with a, um, a URL and a link to my new, uh, my new service that I've requested. And uh, as always with the demonstration, it tends to be a bit slow every now and then. There we go. Perfect. My request ID submitted. There is the, the, the request ID number. And let me open it up and show you what it looks like. Perfect. So here is my uh, request for employ employment verification done simply through using natural language processing and natural language chat, uh, and then executing uh, through through a third digital workplace. Perfect. Um, I think Kev from our side, that's uh, me complete. Excellent. Thank you very much, Des, for doing this. It saved me quite some time to ask you to yeah. do it. So good to have you on the call. I think we'll hand over to Deepak now, and he's going to talk about some of the other features we have added in DWP in this. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. We can see your slides. You can see the slides? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Kaf and Des, for the great demo. So um, I'll quickly take you through the other enhancements, major enhancements that we are uh, doing in the the other aspect for improving the employee productivity, you know, to remove, break those silos really that employees are really working, right? So that's the whole motto of digital workplace, how we get employees closer. So in this release, starting this release, you'll start seeing that um, collaborators can be added right at the time of the submission. And it basically allows to have, you know, that you, they get the notification right away, the collaborators, rather than actually adding it at a later stage. Um, they also see the updates right at the time of the beginning of the request, right? So there is no communication delay or things that they've basically missed. So you had option to add collaborators before. Uh, what we have done is now, rather, other than just the automatic sharing, which you can do under your, your own preferences, uh, you will start seeing that the collaborators can be added or removed at the time of submission. And it's not only restricted to the automatic sharing that happens. The other thing that if, if you have done previously around to-dos, right, which was on the business workflow side, uh, we have enhanced that. So uh, let me so let me track back to what to-dos are really, and those who are not from the business workflows background can, how can it, you know, you can correlate it to um, ITSM, IT service management, right? So uh, it's a systematic way of obtaining a response from the end user, right? When you when an agent is working on any case, right? When I'm saying case, it's actually a business workflow case. But if you have to correlate it to ITSM, it's actually if they're working on any fulfillment, which is the incident, work order, or a change. Um, and I'm just really so if they're working on a case, they can 
get a structured response from their end users, and that is called as to dos, right? And it's very specific to business workflows. When I say to dos, right now it's only available for uh, business workflows, case management applications. So what it really would work is if you have business workflows application, you would raise a fulfillment. You know, end user basically can create cases. The agent can also raise a case. But if you had to really get a response, a structured response from a user, like let's say for example, acknowledging a policy or basically uploading their legal documents at the time of joining, or uh, you know, like any document related to the visa status or social security updates and things like that, you can basically assign a task back to them. So then without raising any request, you as an agent can, or a hiring manager can directly interact with the end user to get those. And that's called as to-dos in digital workplace. And on the business workflow side, this is also called as to-dos, but they are actually tasks. So a task which is associated to a business workflow case is a to-do type, really, right? Previous release, when we initially released this as, as an MVP, really, you started seeing that you had no actions. All you can do is just acknowledge market as completed. But now we have enforced actions that people can, you know, it becomes mandatory for end user to fill the form before completing the to-do. So that's what you see. Now it is tied to a DWP questionnaire and I'll show you the demo so it becomes more clear. Uh, on these to-dos, we are allowing option to, to save it as a draft. So you will see that button of save and close. And then also uh, if the agent is not or a hiring manager is not really happy with the kind of response that they receive, they can reopen and reassign it to the user. And we'll see a demo of that also. So it again shows up on the end user DWP UI without any end user effort, but they'll they'll get the entire questionnaire back. They'll have to fill it with a deadline and then it's again submitted back to the same to-do task. And uh, this is, I really wanted to emphasize, this is like one of the top voted ideas on the community. And those of you really feel that product managers do not look into ideas or we do not really, uh, you know, provide any updates. This is like one of the uh, reflections that, you know, we really look into your ideas, your votes. This was one of the highest voted uh, item on the communities. And we are happy to say that we have actually fixed this and, you know, we have provided the feature in this particular release. So those of you who are familiar with the broadcast, uh, you when you search the audiences you would get basically a number right like for example if you were to select a com company from the from the foundation you would get a number which is nothing but a number of the group in the group form uh, which is non intuitive it's not easy to understand non manageable so what we have done we have introduced that you can now start searching with the group name so with a human readable language you just type with your keyboard you don't need to really remember it would still give you the group number but it will give you the full long group name. So you will be able to see the entire hierarchy. So if it was a support group, you'll see that it belonged to a department and a support group, so the entire hierarchy will be visible. And on multiple screens where you interact, with, you know, while duplicating or while uh, sending like a service health alert, everywhere, wherever you have this same model, it will start showing you the same behavior. And I'll give you a demo of it once we get into the demo part. So that's a major usability enhancement. Uh, this is another big item, which a lot of you have been asking me or Carl Anders in our, our interaction that we introduced this feature in 21.3 that you can show the fulfillment details, right? But you need more information on the fulfillment. Let's say who it is assigned to, what are the resolution nodes, when was it last updated, right? Uh, what is the support group? Who's the owner group and things like that. So what we have done uh, for all ITSM application where in you know digital workplace creates a fulfillment, you will start seeing them under that screen in the administration. And then there are predefined fields that BMC has provided through which you can basically select, admin can select what all fields to basically show up in the request 360 view, which is nothing but the details view of the fulfillment. And you will start seeing like a three dot menu where you'll get this model and all the information that you have selected to be shown as an admin will be visible to the end user. No synchronization needed. It's real time. Enable the configuration. 
can I just stop you there? Sorry, um, the audio keeps dipping out. I don't know if it's your headphone. Sorry to interrupt, but um, I'm hearing it a few times now. I don't know if you've got a problem yourself, but I've had a few people messaging to say that your audio is dipping out and it's going a bit re robotic. Okay, so let's quickly take a few questions. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll, yeah, I'll try to just reconnect my headset. Sorry for okay, that. thank you. So, um, Kath, I'm probably going to just point over to you if that's OK, because I, I obviously want him to finish off um, with what he was explaining. So there's a couple of questions that we've got into the Q&A. So Philippe's got a question. I don't know if that's either yourself or Des can answer that question. Um, is there a question designer, an element type for numbers and numbers operation using actions? Example request to computer and three mouses. Could this be possible to add a field that informed total costs related to the five elements? Calculated with information with the element have. So I don't know if either you or Des can. I need to that read question. it. Read it. It's a, it's a complex. It's very long. <laughs> is there a quest? Maybe Philippe, are you on there so you could maybe explain it in words? Let, let me unmute him because we typically don't until the end. So um, Philippe, I can see you're still there. Do you want to come off mute and explain your question while we have Deepak reconnect with his headset? Yeah, of course. Did you hear me, right? Yes. We do. Hello. Hello. Uh, we, we had a customer that uh, we wanted to sell like a service, uh, work like a, an a store where they could uh, have a list of the of the elements that uh, they are available in their environment to assign to the users, right? But they, these elements should... And we will improve it over time. Meanwhile, I should say, what customers are doing when the, the, I mean, DWP is meant to be a quick way to create forms and, and workflow for, for uh, raising requests. If you have very specific UI interactions you want to build or you want to do something very custom, uh, you can build a lot more advanced features like the thing you asked for here in uh, Innovation Studio. And then you can extend the capability of DWP by adding that custom app as a page in, in DWP, like any other studio page. So that I've seen customers doing uh, quite a lot of. Some customers have, have tens, fifteens of those custom applications, which feels like they are in DWP, but they they are actually an innovation suite app uh, to, to get that more uh, interactive experience than you get in the WP, which is more raise a request and submit approach while you're talking about more. We add things and then we submit the order. So yes, something like that. Do, are you ready to go back, Deepak? Yes, I hope you are able to hear me fine now. We can, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully it was just uh, not the internet, but just the headset. So I've changed the headset, so hopefully it should be okay. So I'm sharing my screen. Give me a thumbs up if you are able to see it. A quick confirmation. Yes, yes okay. we can see it. Perfect. All right. So yes, so you'll start seeing as where I left, you'll start seeing these fields on the on the fulfillment, you know, from the fulfillment application in, uh, in your DWP. Request details screen. Unfortunately, it's still hacking. Now, moving on to the next feature, which is again enhancement of the repeatable type of group. Okay, yeah. Let's give it a shot again. I don't know if it is just the. Yeah, maybe stay off camera, Deepak. That might be sometimes it's a bandwidth issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, Give me one quick second. I'll probably switch over to another network. OK. All right. Um, I hope you're able to hear me fine now. Fingers crossed. Yes. <laughs> okay. So yes. So with the with the dynamically repeatable section, which was previously introduced in you know in multiple releases, as you see you've seen 
we did a lot of incremental updates. And, uh, you know, here we are introducing that with this dynamically repeatable set of questions, you will have checkbox and the drop down multi select field type available, text area and the file attachments. Right. So, um, again, to go back, you'll probably have to, if you're not familiar with repeatable group of questions, you'll have to go back uh, from where we started. But it's essentially a question which can be looped. Uh, same set of questions can be looped multiple time. You can answer and then that's going to either create one answer, uh, you know, can create basically one fulfillment if you would like to create, or you can send the entire response of that question into a single uh, fulfillment as an attachment like a CSV, right? So we introduced more fields. Our uh, target is that even in the upcoming release, we'll provide all the possible fields that we support. And then, you know, we basically, uh, you know, complete the feature, uh, right? So this is just nothing but an incremental update. But if you have any questions, feel free to put a comment. If you would like to know more about this repeatable group of questions, I'll put some documentation and blog link. So you'll know about it, but it's an incremental update really. And then for a lot of you, those who are bilinguals and then you speak different languages, it's been a challenge that, you know, when you are querying, uh, you know, like the, the dynamic values, you never received a accent sensitive, uh, you know, insensitive, insensitive search. Basically to summarize, right? Let's say if you are typing Jose. So if you just write S J O S E, you will get only J O S E from those dynamic fields. But now if you have any accent ca accented characters in Jose, which a lot of North America and South America companies uh, countries have that um, in the name, you will start getting that right. And even in the other continents also, like you know, people speak with those like in Germany. If you talk about my boss's name, they he has got a uh, you know a special uh, accented character in his name. So you will not be restricted. Now your search will for these kind of drop down fields, uh, multi select and single select dynamic querying fields will be accent insensitive. It's again an incremental update, but we have tried to provide that support. So it is consistent with all other question types that we have, wherever you can do searching, on-screen searching. Now I'll quickly get on to the demo. And then for this, I really had to connect to the VPN because I disconnected myself for the instability. So if you allow me like one quick minute, I'll get back myself on this, but we'll, uh, you know, while this is happening, Feel free to put down your questions and you know we'll try to share more resources and uh, we will begin with to do's right as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, which is a structured way of obtaining a response. Those of you who are not familiar with business workflows because I know everybody doesn't have business workflow licenses. Uh, I'll try to give you some references how what it really means from the ITSM perspective, right? And then you can try to correlate. So, but even though we don't have support for ITSM to do's right now, um, but I really wanted to make it simple for you all. So you understand. Place and they really request something, but now it's time for agents to really communicate with the end user. Right. I'll quickly give you a preview first and then we go into how the designing really works. Right. So this is a to do task really. Right. It's available to me uh, and it shows the expected date and this is the name of the task and it tells me it is in progress right now. It shows up in my event active event block. I can go and I can continue and then it's nothing but a questionnaire which will load here. Right. I can just answer and I can submit and this is going to go back to my business workflows. Uh, to do task. Now, what does that really mean from the administrator perspective? We'll quickly, you know, and from the people, those who really configure it, how it really works. So if, you know, you first need to, on any application, uh, you need to really define the template, right? So those who are familiar with incident management or work order management on ITSM side, you had templates really, right? So same happens for the case management, you have templates that you can define for quicker, pre-population of the fields and you know those who are familiar with ITSM ITSM had tasks that you can associate with work order and the change application that you can associate a task for a separate team to be done right but it's only for agents now this model has been extended here for business workflows that you can define case first and then you can define a template task template and then task can be internal 
and a to do task can be delegated to the end user. Right. So that's the difference. So the way it's going to work, you first define the template. So in my case, I, I'm taking an example of a person who recently joined and I'm trying to get the, uh, you know, the experience or about to join. I'm trying to get the experience letter from experience certificate from the previous employer. So first I have like a task created in interest of time. I'm not going to create it from scratch. I have it created and it's called as, as you can see, it's a to do type of task on business workflow. So nothing, but if you just create, if you create on task creation, it's going to be to do. And you nothing, but you basically define pre-population of the field, like summary and what kind of task to which line of business does it belong company and all, are you allowing it to be reopened in how many days it should be completed and things like that, right? What you see here is called as dynamic questions. They will populate only after you create questionnaire. Uh, so right now it's created. So that's why you see it. But uh, those of you, those who are familiar with ITSM, uh, if you go back to work order type application, you have work order type fields where you can change the labels and you can change the data, right? You can pre -populate, you can populate that data. It's equivalent to that. These are called as dynamic fields in business workflows language. So now you have this created a task template created. Now it's bottom to up approach. Now you create a case template. For simplicity, I've already created this before. So we don't have to really spend time on creating this. But if you open this, you can see the summary is pre-populated and then line of business information and the status to which company does this belong, all of this foundational work. But one addition, what you see is I have a task associated to this case. In ITSM, you would have done it at the time of template creation that you associate a, temp a task group or a task to a work order template, for example, right? Same same methodology here with business workflows. So I'm going to quickly put it in the draft mode because I, the system doesn't allow you to modify this until you do a draft mode. So you can change the task flow. And you know, you can add the task flow if you're creating new, but I'm because I'm in the edit mode, I'm just going to show you that you can create a task flow, how it works. It opens a view in innovation suite, right? And then um, there is there is a there is a process element which basically yeah you know create task really that you can basically populate here right basically you can bring it here and then you can pass the values for it to understand what all type of parameters you want to pass again i do not want to really create it from scratch so as you can see i have created some variables which are input variables which it will receive from uh, from business workflow so they need to be there uh, the dynamic data case records and case id but when going into this brick, when I'm actually doing a mapping, what I'm saying is you map case ID to the case ID that is received. And then here you have a template that you can basically define the template. So it's nothing but the template you just defined. So in ITSM, you would have gone in the UI and you would have basically associated it. But here, um, you know, you it's you have to really go into the uh, IS view. So to associate it and you can see yeah so experience certificate so you basically can quickly cross refer to whether it's right template yes or no right from here and can select and that's what i have done the moment you select that all these instance id the template name and the type all of this summary will be pre-populated if you want to modify it personalize it you can do all of that you know the capability that's capability of workflow and the, our low code, no code platform. Once that is done, you are ready. The only step you do not should not forget is to publish it. Once it is published, it's all done right now. Uh, this was the administrator pa administration part on the DWP side on the catalog. You need to really have a questionnaire right to uh, to complement this really. So what would happen is on the DWP catalog side, you will need to create a questionnaire, which is now added under service actions. It's not a service. Remember that it's a service action. And under the service action, you can create an action and it there is a type called as task actions. Okay, so in interest of time, I'm not going to create that, but I have one created for you. Once you create it, it's going to show you a work fulfillment associated to it. Uh, you can activate, deactivate it, you can edit on it, and then simply 
it's nothing but a workflow which is comprising of a process behind the scene and a questionnaire right so let's take the workflow first because that's how you those of you who are familiar with designing the catalog know that you have to design workflow first and then questionnaire later right so now why do you need this you really need this because you the case is created by the agent the to do task is pushed by the agent end user has to really respond back so they need to send also their updates back to business workflows task so there we have introduced a brick a process element from here called as update task and using which um, you know before i do that i'll tell you you know you have the the context variable created here because you want to retain the responses right and you want to retain and you want to use that data in the entire life cycle of the process so then you have this you define your connector in my case the innovation suite connector because business workflows is an innovation suite uh, application and then i have my task id uh, which is nothing but again as i mentioned because that's carried in the service broker context and you will see it here that you have the id so you, it system needs to know what task i need to really update right and that's that's how you will maintain it in the broker con service broker context and you need to pass that and then behind the scenes you have to remember that we will create a service request uh, it's a service request which is not a normal service request um, it will not be visible to the user so end user will still see the task but it's going to be a light weighted service request which will still be visible to you under your service request reports so we are providing you way to track that so then under the service broker context again you can set the uh, you know the service request id and then login name is the person who's requesting so in my case it is whoever is on dwp so basically a variable for requested for user and because we are so tightly integrated you don't need, do not need to really parse the json responses you can just simply send the entire question and answer variables to your business workflow and business workflow will basically take care of mapping that into the tasks automatically into the dynamic fields created there now we are done with the workflow creation just the last bit which is the questions that you need to ask right so designing of the questions need to be done here the most important part of this question is you need to define the task template id this is very important because you need to tell system that what template am i really sending this data to right so and it's going to be a hidden field your users don't need to really know this you create it and here it's a text field and i have mentioned that i am going to introduce a new type as task type and then you know you can the moment you select that all the tasks template would show up from business workflow here in my case i'm selecting employee experience certificate and then rest everything else is the simple question that you create user generated question you drag and drop and then you ask the questions and then basically let them submit the response right so no no nothing special after this really this was whatever you've seen before until this part is all key for this integration once all of this is there you are ready to go right so now from the flow perspective how would it really work so let's go back to in the day in the life of uh, an agent who's working on the cases really right so i go to business workflow create a case and i so let's say let's say let's see it's an agent or maybe a hiring manager right so let's assume i'm a hiring manager for example and i want to obtain uh, joining you know the previous employment experience from my new joinee so i am going to quickly um select it here oh sorry it's staff onboarding yeah so that's the name of our case template right so staff onboarding i just basically select that and i apply as you know it's a it's a normal template functionality you're all here all in here everything is automatically populated you just save it right it's going to take care that once the case is submitted a task is generated for the end user and you can see a task is automatically associated which we previously created in the flow so you can go to the details view and like any other itil life cycle or a best practice you don't directly send task to the end user it is in the staged state staged uh, those who are of you familiar with itsm there was a state called staged for tasks there also 
And then basically you are done with some further formalities and then you put it in the progress. You're ready to send it to the end user for responding. And you can now see that the task is moved into assigned state. And let's look it into, you know, what an end user would really see now, right? So I'm an, I'm the end user to whom the task was assigned. I see that now the task is started showing up on my screen. It's a structured way of obtaining a response now. And they can't respond in the way they want. They want to respond in the questionnaire that I'm asking them to respond back to me. So they can get started. It has got all the expected by dates, so it, it will show the overdue details and all everything. So it's a simple question that's asking, provide me the experience certificate. So I'm saying my legal full name is this. And you know, then I am working with BMC software, for example, right now. And I started way back in 2012. And I'm still working, so I'm going to select the current date. You can design. My designation is principal PM. Um, and then I'm going to attach the experience certificate. Right? And just for simplicity, let's upload any JPEG file here. You can uh, attach any uh, anything, whatever your system is configured to really attach. Uh, and you can create your own questionnaire, more complex questionnaire. It doesn't have to be that simple. And then I submit and complete. So once it is submitted and complete, it as you can see, it's gone to my past events. And let's see from the agent perspective what happens. So on the agent side, it tells me it's pending for my review, review required. It didn't directly close it, right? I can configure this, all of this. I can directly put it into close status or I can just say re review required. And all my responses are now into these dynamic fields. See, if you can see, including the attachment, now I'm not happy with the resolution probably of this image. I'm going to reopen this and send a response back to user. Um, need better resolution image and make it public and then post it back. Now this is another slide that you saw, which was about reopening. So without end user doing anything, um, I have assigned it back to the end user. And if the end user basically will get the email notification from business workflows, um, but on the DWP side, you can see the same is op open back. And for your best employee productivity, we are retaining their previous responses. So they don't have to really start from the scratch. So now if they click here, you can see a continue button. If it was a new thing, it would say, you know, details. Now you will see a continue button is available. They click on it. It directly takes them to the previous ans previously answered question. The values are copied again. In fact, even the attachment, they can delete it and attach a new attachment, right? And uh, I mean, I can even I can even go back and see why this was returned back to me. I have the comment here. Need better resolution image. So my comment is returned there, and then I can respond to it. For example, I just deleted it and reattached it, and I can submit it, and it's done, right? Right, and on again on the agent side, you would see again it goes into pending status. I'm happy now. This time, I basically mark it as completed. So that was the life cycle of the entire to-do interaction. Right, I know it's a it was a little bit lengthy explanation, but I think it was important to make you understand how this interaction is going to work. The last thing that I would show is we also have capability that you can. Again, re at the time of reopen, you saw the responses were sent back. But right now, you'll also have option while answering that. Let's say if you filled, you know, you filled half of the questionnaire, right? And you think uh, you need some more data. So what you can say, you can do save and close. Your responses are saved in that particular task. So then what you can do is you can again resume from where you left. So as you can see, you came you came here, Your my response was already retained. So you don't lose the data really. So they can start from where they left. So that's all about the to-do tasks um, integration with business workflows. Right now we don't have it for ITSM, but uh, I hope it, it made a lot of sense uh, to you all. So the next thing that I really want to show you is about collaboration, right? Uh, collaborating right at the time of submission. Right. So let's assume a hiring manager is raising a request for onboarding for a new person. 
right? Um, so, you know, first, it is, uh, you know, first, earlier what we used to do is we used to let them submit the request first and then you go into each item and then, you know, update the collaborator. So now in this case, new high request, I'm going to request and I'm taking a very complex example, little complex example. So you know that on an individual request basis, it works. But when you have bundles or when you even submit the carts, it's going to work the same way. So as you can say, see right away on the checkout screen itself, you can see that the auto sharing is enabled and it's auto share to Alan because he's my default collaborator right now, but I can quickly change it. So that's a new behavior that you can see, right? Uh, so I am again going to select for the simplicity sake and then just submit all of this real quick. So on the day one, he needs a PC, he needs access to Wi-Fi, let's say for probably for, uh, you know, like one week until the, you know, just in worst case, if the AD, you know, access to Wi-Fi doesn't work with the AD, then at least use a guest Wi-Fi. And then what kind of application access does this person need? Office 365, on what day? On the date of joining on 11th and new joinee. And then I submit the request. So with one selection, I'm able to keep Alan and myself in sync right at the beginning. And I don't have to really do n number of clicks to make it work post request submission. So we are re reducing that churn between the submitter and the collaborator that it can happen now. As you can see, each service, which is part of this entire order, is actually containing that collaborator. Later on, if you would like to change the collaborator or append the collaborator, you have that already had that option. You know, you can add and remove more people from here. So that's one change that we have done in this release. Moving on to the next item, uh, which is you will start seeing the admin button right under the user preferences here. So uh, here you don't have to really remember the admin credentials. If you are assigned admin permission in your foundation data for digital workplace administration, you will have like a drop down selection for administration from here. Once you click on it, it's going to automatically take you to the admin page. No URL configuration, nothing. You don't need to really remember anything or bookmark any URLs for administration. That's another enhancement, a uh, quality of life, increasing employee productivity kind of enhancement that we have done. Now, coming back to the, the other item where I, was, where I was showing you all, showing more fulfillment information for the end users, right? Let's quickly deep dive into that a little bit. Those of you who are familiar with request, you know, fulfillment details feature that we introduced in 21.3, we have actually expanded on that. So let's take a look at one example where I have, yeah, here, right? For example, I have more than one fulfillment. So it's better I can show you more fulfillments together. So this feature existed before where you can show the fulfillment details. Uh, I hope you are all familiar with this. If you are not, I'm going to quickly show you. So under configuration, in the administration screen, you will get a section called fulfillment details. And then this already existed before, right? You can basically show under my activity or request details view. So that's what I, it was really existing before. You used to see a chat icon before here, comment icon, not the chat, but the comment icon. Now you'll start seeing this three dot menu. Um, so from what happens really, let's say, let's understand from the end user perspective. End user will get more details from the fulfillment. The moment they click on it, you, your whatever fields your admin has defined, um, those will be shown here really. And it's real time. It's going to be fetched from directly from the backend, from the ITSM fulfillment application. It doesn't have to be synced. There is no sync needed really. Same for incidents. As you can see, it's uh, you know the priority of the incident status. What who is the assignee? Who is the owner? Who is the owner group? And then what is the resolution notes? All of that will be available. If the data is not available, it will be shown as a as a hyphen there until the data is made available. And these are fields, that, selected fields that we are supporting in this release, and you will have that in your dropdowns here. 
So from the admin perspective, as you can see, change implementer group, I have not highlighted. I can quickly check that status reason I have not highlighted. I can quickly select that for business workflows. Only two fields are there from incident management. You know, you can see these fields are already available and for work order, you can see these fields are available. So I'm going to quickly save this and let's see the difference on the change management side, right? As I was telling you, it's a real time information. It doesn't get synced up. It is real time. So as you can see, more fields are now started showing up. If they existed there the, in the fulfillment, they will show up here with a value. If not, then a hyphen. Really. So that's about the next feature which is coming up. Then there is those of you, those who are familiar, as I mentioned about the broadcast, that's, that's one of the top most voted ideas on the community today. Um, what we have fixed. So if you are in this admin UI for the broadcasts, so you create a new broadcast. So let's say you say exchange is down and you say it's a, it's a critical error. And then you select your audiences really when who it should be delivered to, right? So you, you define user groups. So let's say I want to send it to Apex Global. And earlier I had to really remember the name uh, ID of the Apex Global because it's a company and in the group form, it's actually a group ID. So now what you'll start seeing is the long group information here. Now for Apex Global, whatever is the match, you will start getting that in the search results. So as you can see all the support groups, so Apex Global, then uh, you know facility support organization, and then this is a support group. You're getting all of that information really. So I would like to send it to entire Apex Global, or maybe I can also send it to facilities and I just check mark, select these. They will still show up as a pill there with the ID. The reason is because we had really had to redesign the entire model and for that we need to really do a lot of work. But right now you'll start seeing that um, you will start seeing these check boxes, green check boxes tells you that these are your selection. So you don't need to really remember the numbers. So once you are done with that, next, next, you basically schedule. Okay. And then if you want to take a look at it and you know, you get all the details here, they will still be a number, but if you have to really copy it, that was another pain point from for a lot of customers. Let's say you have to duplicate it, right? And now this time you need to change your audiences. So you already see a number. You will be thinking now, how do I understand really what these number corresponds to? So you again, go back to the edit and you, there you are, right? You will basically see your previous selection uh, there in the list, correct? And uh, you know what you can do now, you can again, go back and search more information. Uh, more names and then add. So you have, as you can see, the previous selection is already shown there to you, right? You can add more selection so you don't lose track of what was previously selected. And then you basically do next, next and you schedule. And that's how you really created a copy with the new groups, right? And you still know that these are the, the groups which is gonna receive. The same behavior is going to be carry forward to, to the other area in the application, which is your service health. If you are using service health, it may resonate well with you. But again, I really wanted to tell you wherever you have um, options like this, uh, wherever you can select like group from, you know, from really from the ITSM, you will be able to get the long group information. So. Here for MS Outlook service, if I need to really make it available to, you know, to assign group, I can just quickly say Apex and then search. It's gonna get me the entire ID list and then the, the full group information. And, you know, if it is, there is a, it's flowing out of the screen, you can hover over it and you have a tool tip and you can add it. So that's how you basically maintain the consistency across you know different screens and then you have your best productivity for your employees so i think this is pretty much it the uh, you know for the repeatable group of questions i am not doing a demo because it was previously released the only difference you will have is you will have checkbox drop down text area and attachment type of fields and you know i can quickly bring up the slides one more time to you know to take you there so i'm not doing a demo of this because this is a pre-existing functionality there's just an additional ad addition to it so we'll support these fields 
and for the accent sensitive search insensitive search i already told you that anywhere you have a drop down you will have this accent insensitive search results returned to you so nothing to really demo there with this i'll conclude my demo and um, thank you so much for listening to me we can quickly you know if samantha allows we can just quickly go into answering the questions now um yeah thank you and um obviously if anyone has to leave um feel free any questions that we don't get to today um we will be formulating a q and a um blog post so you won't miss anything um but let's go over to the q and a so philippe um back over to you actually you had a question in here um do you want to come off mute again and ask your question can you hear me philippe Um, maybe he's having problems. I don't know, uh, Kaf, if you want to take that question Why I unmute everyone else, because obviously they were left on mute. Um, so I'm just going through the process of giving everyone else the ability to talk. So there was a the first question from Philippe. I don't know if you want to take that while I um, continue to unmute everyone. Okay, I can probably, I can go through the, the posted questions and go through that and answer while people are coming off. Okay, so Philippe had um, the first question. I have unmuted him, but I don't know if he can get access. So if you want to take that one first, and then I'll um, go. To, we'll go to Rosanna after. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I kind of already answered that question that we oh, did. Oh, okay, research, still pending. And and uh, so that one, I think we can type oh, a little bit. Okay. In the document. Okay, so then the next question for Philippe, I I say mm -hmm. Des is already answering for, on the GPT part. The next question is from. Um, I think Philippe is available is available DWP notification customization for other languages, adding more fields. Uh, currently, it's limited. Yes. So right now we are working on Philippe. It's, it's a future roadmap item to break, take our notification engine to the Converge platform to Helix platform really, and we do not manage that ourselves, um, right? And not managed by ourselves means really, especially DWP managing own notification engine. So it would ultimately go there and will provide a lot of flexibility. So stay tuned for our roadmap sessions and then for our webinars, we'll definitely bring up and once it is ready, we'll have a demo for that. But yes, it's coming up. Thank the you, next, Dita. Yeah, the next question is when you are going to allow customization of the icons for the ticket created in smart IT or business workflows or knowledge article in DWP. Okay, so uh, knowledge articles, yes, that is in our backlog customizing, you know, the icon for, you know, it's in the discussion for uh, knowledge articles right now for um, what you saw to do's. It has a different icon already, but we are also working with business workflows team to have a, you know, that we allow capability to have a different icon, right? Uh, but again, it's a future item right now. We do not have that capability, but for catalog services, which you are already raising, you have option to set up the profile image really there. So that's going to be carry forward. So that's very personalized. The only two areas I think is business workflows. And then, you know, when a, when a case is created, like what you saw for to do's and knowledge, uh, that's something that we have to work. And for the other question I saw from Jonas is, uh, I noticed Deepak, you did save and close the request ended up in the, my activity. I did not, it did not end up in the shopping cart as it does in 21.3. Yes. So, uh, if you understand, it was only to do task, right? The other behaviors would not change, Jonas. Uh, they would, if you do save and close, that would still go to your cart. To do's um, is something, you know, we are allowing them to really save and come back and respond to it. And that's why it is going to save uh, in the active event because it's already being worked on, correct? So treat it as something which is already submitted to you, right? When you request something from digital workplace, that's your shopping cart uh, because you have not submitted that and you need time to think about that, right? But it's the other way around that it's already submitted. Really people, those who are on the business line or line of business really need you to respond back. So you can't save it in the cart. All you can do is save your response and save it for later and respond back to it at a later stage. So I hope it makes sense. These are two different personas really. Yeah, I understand. Uh, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jonas.
So I think the next okay, one, so... I don't know if we missed it just quickly. Um, we had that one from Rosanna. Did this one get answered? That's up at the top in the version using a bundle service, create a dependency between two services. The second starts only when the first is completed. There was a question. Um, I don't think that one's been answered. Correct me if I'm wrong. Can you see that one, Deepak? No, I don't see that question. It's the first okay. one on the first list one. at the top, yeah. It, yeah. In this version, is it possible using a bundle service create a dependency between two services? I'm. Are, are you on there, Rosanna? Do you mean before it is submitted or after submission or what? what is actually the question? Is it the workflow you're talking about? Or is it in, when you request it? I don't know if Hello. it is still. Hello. Hello. It is uh, referred to um, creation of a bundle uh, in a new version, because in the last version, what I, what I have uh, verified is that it was not possible to create a service that was depending by the completion of the, the previous uh, service that is in the same bundle. It is, you mean after it's submitted, is that what you talk about? Yes, after that you submit. Yeah, yeah okay. When, um, if, uh, we for we haven't really changed. We have not changed that in this release. Uh, so uh, if you couldn't do it before, we didn't really make any improvement on that specific thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I certainly did not see that question. Maybe it was answered already. <laughs> uh, I see another question from anonymous attendee regarding collaborators on submission. Is it possible to collaborate or even approvers uh, to modify, update the initial data type in the questions or DWP service. So is it possible for collaborator even approvers to modify update? No, no. Um, I And I, I'll, you know, me and Carl, we have a very strong opinion about this. And I think it would resonate really well with a lot of you. If you allow answered questions to be edited, you are tempering the system really. A lot of things in the background, if you are, you know, you are really going into, workflows and then you are going into approvals and then things like that you know the business work business uh, um, uh, modeling really you have flows if you change the response which was previously submitted by the user you are tampering the flow of the system really and then you basically toss your authenticity right in your organization i would never recommend that you basically allow changing of the submitted questions you can always, you know, my, our vision is that you can always send a follow-up ta to-do task, right? Right now it's associate, available for business workflows that you can send it for obtaining again a structured response, right? And get the response back, but you do not allow changes of the questions, what were previously, you know, submitted at the time of submission, because there may be a fulfillment which is already triggered, right? Consider that as, you know, I, I, I ordered on the Dell's website of, you know, one gigabyte RAM, and now the it's already sent to the fulfillment, but I now go and change it to two gigabytes. Your authenticity, your fulfillment process, your procurement is all gone for a toss because you're allowing things to be changed, right? So we would really want that approvers should be able to send back uh, the request for addition, you know, for uh, for more justification. With to-do tasks, you'll be able to obtain more response in a structured way, and that still is associated to the fulfillment process. But then you also maintain the audit trail of the information that was previously submitted by the initially submitted by the user. So if you are really doing for SOX compliance and things like that, they really need you to have um, audit trail of things that were changed, right? So I hope it makes sense. Uh, we are not going to allow that. Thanks, uh, Deepak. So there's a couple more questions that were above that one as well. I'll just go back up to that. I don't know if you've got your scroll bar at the bottom, but Philippe had another question. And forgive me, Kath, if you also answer that, because Philippe had a few. What information is displayed in change implementer of fulfillment details if that field does not exist in the change form? Change request implementers are on task. So the change information, which I just shown you, uh, you know, on the screen, uh, that's what you have. 
I can again show it on back to you. I can quickly share my screen. That's the one I which is available. What Philippe is, is asking is actually that field is not default available on uh, smart IT change screens. So the, the reason we used that field is that a lot of customers still use it. It's coming from the old days of um, the mid-tier UI. So that was a request to have that field available on the screen because they, they yeah. have either use the old uh, mid-tier UI or they have added that field to smart IT screens. Yeah, so uh, another aspect to this is, I don't know if, Philip, you can unmute yourself, but if the field does not exist in the form, uh, you can't show it really. If you, I think what you really mean is the view. If the field is not in the view, that's probably the right wording. Um, if the field itself is not in the form, that means it's not recorded anywhere for that particular instance of the record, right? So uh, how would that work, right? Uh, so you're saying the change request implementer are on task, right? What you would have to really do is you need to really bring that field in the core form, in the view, right? And we, in this release, we are supporting, you know, as you all know, progressive view uh, is our way forward. So we are supporting fields from progressive view. And that's what CAF was mentioning. But if the field does not exist there, you need to really bring that field uh, onto the view into that form, right? And that's going to be part of your customization if it's not already there. I hope Philippe. I was able to, yeah. Yeah, I'm just checking, Philippe, you're still on. Do you want to come off mute and just confirm that's answered your question, if you can still hear us? Um, no deep, I'll take the deep, next. I'll take yeah, the next question from Kevin. Uh, yes, Kevin. I, you know, you have a question about 50, uh, 150,000 employees, and it takes time for the back end. Yes, it's a known, uh, you know, thing issue that we are fixing right now. Hopefully, in the next release, uh, we'll have this fixed, right? So you don't have to. When you basically go for a uh, for a large number of audiences, like a company wide broadcast. It doesn't take forever really to reach, right? We know that and we are working on it. So hopefully in our subsequent releases, you will see that resolution. It's not going to be like a feature in itself, but yes, it's a quality improvement and, uh, you know, uh, supportability improvement really. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Did you have any other questions while you were off mute? No, I do not. Okay, thanks. So um, Deepak, the next one was uh, Juan's. I don't know if you can see that in the chat. Yes, I can see it. If I want to only measure the time that request lasted open without taking into account how much incident of work order I can do it. What is the best practice? So Juan, is that is that the measure only the time request was open, last open? And I need a little bit clarity there. Are you trying to measure service level agreements there on the request? Because, you know, when the service request is created, catalog request, you measure the start time, then you have activities, which each of them has their own timestamps. Once they are fulfilled, approval is done, uh, approval is done, fulfillment is done, and then it basically goes into completed state. So that's the entire life cycle. What, what timestamp do you want to measure really? Because that's the entire life cycle. That's there available today out of the box in the service request reports. When it started versus when it ended, really, right? And you have timestamp for each activity the workflow really did. Um, are you trying to measure anything else out of that? I'm really keen to understand. I think it is a follow-up question he asked before about uh, SLM. And uh, I said you can measure the time on the incidents and work orders and so on. Yeah. So, so even for request, to, yeah, even for request, it? yeah, you will be able to measure that. As I mentioned, it's already available. If you take a look at your service request reports in DWP catalog and open the report, you will be able to see start and end time at the bottom. That's for overall process completion, right? When it was initiated, uh, you know, then it went through approval, mm -hmm. fulfillment, closure, 
that's how you measure the entire end to time if you feel there is any discrepancy on send an email to to me and calendars and we can take a look at it and, and, and ideally do it on communities and get people talking about it because then we get a kind of gauge of how many people want to have this it's it's kind of what i have answered before on the many other things here please get started talking about it on communities yeah then the next question is on um broadcast Uh, I don't know if I'll be able to pronounce the name. Mamadou, I think. Mamadou, yes, he, yeah. He was on yeah, yesterday. Sorry if I didn't pronounce <laughs> it properly. Um, so in broadcast, the group list name that are available now display are ITSM group forms. So they are the group form, really. The core platform cap capability, not ITSM. So group, right? So even the group form that you have that holds that group ID, long group name, short group name, and you can have type of group computed groups and things like that that's the one then your next question is in the mid year you can create a broadcast on site organization department do we have the same option in dwp broadcast with this release so site organization department organization and department yes uh, because that will be coming from the group so there will be a group id associated so organization and department you will see you will be able to identify right that but the only problem before was you had to remember the id now you can search it by the name with site site goes into a different schema altogether uh, which we do not query at this point so answer is no for site right we have not enhanced broadcast uh, functionality we have just improved the searchability of the groups that were coming up as a numbers before now it's going to be much more logical and with full hierarchy as you had already seen 